Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics and in this video I like to discuss the latest economic news and uh, we find that the third quarter of this year was even worse than the, f the first thought after further analysis and that Brexit has cost us 5.5% of our GDP to date and cost us tax revenues that would have avoided the Tories' current fiscally illiterate spending plans right now. I am wondering if some Conservatives are not regretting Brexit at this point. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So Christmas Eve, and um, what's the best story about Christmas Eve? A greedy, grasping banker who is given a lesson in introspection in order to mend their wicked ways. In the process, the quality of their life improves. Their own life gets better. Everyone's a winner. Written by the most celebrated woke author in British literary history. I wonder if any Tories are looking back on their Brexit conduct and thinking that their own lives would be much easier right now if they'd abandoned the path when it was easier to do so. Let's just look at the headline figures for a second. The third quarter of this year, which the government crowed about seeing positive growth for a while, it was only very marginal, actually turned out to be a contraction of the economy. Now the economic data, it, you know, it's complex. It takes a lot of analysis. If you jump on it too soon, uh, don't be upset to see that the picture has changed a few months later after more detailed analysis. There's a reason why it takes a long time to get the latest accurate economic figures. It takes a very long time to gather, it takes a very long time to collate and a very long time to analyse. So the latest now is our economy shrank by 0.3% in the third quarter of this year, which means that when the figures for the last quarter, the one we're coming towards the end right now, are out sometime in the new year, we will officially be in recession. No one believes that this quarter represents growth right now. We know that our economy is contracting. All the signs are there. But it's only officially a recession when you've got two consecutive quarters of contraction. You wouldn't want everyone to go mad about a recession just because one little quarter went down. And this means that the headlines will be hitting the public in winter rather than spring, as the Tories may have hoped for, or maybe they wouldn't, I don't know, piling on the bad news upon bad news, which is sending the Conservatives out of power at the next election. But I'd like to just stop and consider an alternative scenario. Right from the start, when Keir Starmer was made Labour leader, he said he wanted the next election to be, out, be about the economy. I remember thinking about that. Yeah, Brexit's still going to be a pretty par big part of it. But, you know, he tries talking about anything else, really, doesn't he? He knows that if he makes the debate about the economy, he wins. The government, for their part, want it to be about almost anything else. They even want to talk about immigration and Brexit, despite the very obvious view amongst the public that these are policy areas that are nothing to crow about. Doesn't matter where you stand on the debate about Brexit or immigration and asylum. Everyone thinks the government are making an arse of it. But if you expect a kick in the balls, then a slap in the face is a victory. And the economy is there kicking the balls. But think how different it could have been without Brexit. If David Cameron had enough of a backbone to just face down the ERG, well, you want a referendum? Well, you're not getting one. Shut up. Simple as that. That's all he had to do. We're not having a referendum. Now stop causing trouble or you'll just end up letting Labour in. Do you want Ed Miliband as Prime Minister? Because that's how you get Ed Miliband as Prime Minister. Bear in mind that the reason the majority of Tories went along with Brexit, despite knowing how crazy it is, was to protect that veneer of party unity. They know that disunity cost them the elections. Well, Cameron could have used that against the ERG, but he was too weak. He thought he had a cunning plan. Right, I'm too cowardly to face up to them. I know, I've got a cunning plan, right? What I'll do, I'll promise the referendum, go in the manifesto and everything, then... Because, you know, there'll be another coalition. I'm not going to win a majority. There'll be another coalition. The Lib Dems will completely cock block me and job done without having to engage in any activity that might be considered leadership. But Lib Dem voters were not happy with austerity and they abandoned their party. The irony being that austerity ended up being an electoral reward for the Tories. Well, sort of. They won a majority and the referendum had to be issued. The rest is history. But what if it wasn't? Or what if Remain just ran a better campaign and won? Either way, without Brexit, it's estimated that our tax revenues would now be £40 billion higher. 
Our economy would have recovered, just like all the other advanced economies from COVID. Yes, we'd still be going through the turbulent times that global pressures are genuinely creating, but we wouldn't have had the huge shortages in our workforce. The Tories need only be suffering politically from genuinely genuine external issues. In fact, without Brexit, we would now have a more competent Conservative government. It wouldn't even be the same people. The reason there are so many munchkins in the Cabinet is because it had to be packed out with people who would go along with the hard Brexit as if it's a good policy. Well, that limits your pool of intelligent ministers because only so many of them will be corrupt enough to go along with the complete nonsense of it all. So without Brexit, we could have had a competent Tory government, a stronger economy, no serious labour shortages, high tax revenues without the rate of tax having to go up. There would have been none of the illiberal legislation making peaceful protest illegal or removing the independence of structures like, you know, say the Electoral Commission. I mean, let's not go mad. It would be the same Tories, the same Tories who inflicted austerity. You know, and will do so again, and have done so again. The same Tories undermining our public services in order to abolish them altogether. The same Tories who put pressure on others to get their mates out of trouble. But from their point of view, a Conservative government that wouldn't have the weaknesses it has now. The dates of past elections would have been different as well, but we may still will be heading for a general election in 2024. That was still possible. And being in power for 14 years at the time, the public, yes, may well be getting a bit unsure, a bit edgy. But without the uh, economic collapse, as well as the brain drain from the cabinet that Brexit brought, it wouldn't be as easy for Labour to be enjoying quite the high poll ratings they have now. Unless, of course, the Tories imploded over something else entirely. But I do wonder if some Conservative MPs are looking at the situation, reflecting on the past decade and wondering if they would not be in a much stronger position if only they'd taken on the UKIP entryists in their party. But we are where we are. The economy is in decline. And not just decline as in it's contracting. We do get recessions from time to time. They always seem to be the result of some cock-up, but they happen. But our capacity to recover strongly after this one is badly damaged as I've been discussing in other videos this week. The data shows that our investment is well down on what would otherwise have been the case. Our total trade is down as, as well by 7% in, in trading goods in the second quarter of this year. That's a combination of lower consumer choice because it's harder and more expensive to import now, but also an economic hit because it's harder and more expensive to export. We haven't compensated with easier exports around the rest of the world, as the Tories tried to claim. Not a single post-Brexit trade deal actually makes it easier for us to export anywhere compared to being in the EU. In some cases, like with the Japanese trade deal, most famously, our post-Brexit deals actually made it harder to trade compared to if we just didn't bother with anything. Now, this is a problem for Labour almost as much as the Tories. Labour can promise to reinvigorate the economy in order to win power. And being perfectly honest, the bar is set so low that, you know, they can hardly fail to deliver on that promise in the early years. But voters aren't going to be satisfied with an economy that's just a bit better than shit. Come the following election, when Labour look to a second term, the Tories will have had a bit of a clear out. They'll be presenting voters with a partially new look front bench. I'm sure they're not going to shift radically on various positions, but they will at least pretend to have gone through a, uh, a transformation. It'll be Labour's task to boost the economy to the point where people can see it, despite what the Tory press will try and tell them if they want to win that following election. And then if they do win that following election, they're going to have to do better. Being outside the most important market to us is a barrier to that, it's a glass ceiling. But it still remains a bigger problem to the Tories. It's fairly clear that Labour are taking a hard line on the single market and customs union, but they're more than happy to talk about, you know, standards agreements with the EU, closer deals on not just trade, but security, for example. They're not constrained by being complicit in Brexit, only by the views of the small numbers of voters who determine elections. Once they switch, so will Labour. But the Tories have got to go against the media that sustains them. See, a lot of people will bemoan the fact that the Conservatives control so much of the media. They don't, really. In terms of the printed media, it's the Tory press that controls the politicians, not the other way around. People are mixing up the organ grinder and the monkey here. This is why the Tory press will turn on the leader of the party if they don't do what they want. But the politicians never turn on the press. 
So to reverse their Brexit position, the Tories need to take on the media, take on some donors, even take on some of their own number. They'll have to do it, and when they do, it will be a very tough battle, which is why I don't think they'll do it anytime soon. I liken it to Ukraine, really. Like if only the West had dealt with the initial incursion in 2014, which was only really Putin testing the waters, then we could have avoided the escalation now. It would have been quicker, easier, cheaper. Always is. Always is. Appeasement always means a tougher battle later on, every single time. When you ignore that battle, the longer that you, you ignore it, the more it costs you in the long run. I think the Tories will see this with Brexit. It was easily dealt with 10 years ago. One person, David Cameron, could have nipped it in the bud, no problem. No cost to him, political or otherwise. All they had to do was tell the ERG to shut up. Now Brexit is so deeply entrenched in all levels of their party, including their leadership and their various support mechanisms, that it will be a real battle. But without it, there will be no way to grow the economy to people's expectations. Inflation will continue to be high. Public funding will continue to be low. A government that delivers this will always struggle in an election. It doesn't matter if it's Labour or the Conservatives. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. If you'd like to support the channel further, uh, the join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.